We're, we're going to try now to begin starting the pivot in our day when um, we be begin to shift towards uh, hearing a lot of uh, information from experts and beginning to have you think about applying what you've heard during the day to the charrettes that will begin in um, in uh, probably an hour or so, uh, 45 minutes to an hour. And because those charrettes are based in spaces and uh, addressing some challenges that are at the Hopkins Center, we felt it was only fair to you to try to do as quickly as we could a snapshot about what exists at the Hop, um, to give you some sense of a 50 of of the history uh, to do with the hop because we are headed towards the 50th anniversary that uh, has significant impacts as we think about our future. Uh, and then to talk about the, that vision for the future and then to take you through some of the capital challenges we've already identified, much of which is going to be uh, actually repetitive with what you've heard already in the terms of wish lists from uh, faculty members and students. Um, so to start, um, the Hopkins Center, like all of the MUPS members, has a very significant, very active uh, uh, artist, visiting artist engagement program um, with huge residencies, uh, internships, commissions, all of the kinds of things that almost all of us have some part of this kind of activity. But as soon as you get beyond that to do with the Hopkins Center, you begin to get into anomalous territory to do with MUPS. Uh, almost none of the rest of the MUPs have, have a film program, and certainly none of them that I'm aware have as big, as prolific a film program and as long-standing a film program as we do. 200 plus films a year, a year, plus now showing operas as much as we can because it's one of the few things we do that actually does make money, uh, thank God. Um, we also, uh, anomalously, although having developed over the years very happily, every once in a while, investigated closely with the, the faculty and departments involved. The student ensembles, uh, there are nine of them, one in dance and theater, which Peter Hackett referred to, and all the rest in music. I, I love using this picture for today because partly it's one of my favorite rooms, the Allen Room uh, at Jazz at Lincoln Center, where our, uh, our own Barbary Coast Jazz Ensemble, student ensemble, toured to. Also, it gives me a chance to do a brief commercial for the importance of touring and how we're uh, trying to emphasize that more and more as we head towards the 50th anniversary. We also know that it's very anonymous, that is unique, that a performing arts center or an arts center such as us has student workshops. We, have, we do crafts here as well uh, in a very intensive and uh, professionally oriented way. And then finally, and this is a relatively new development, although you can see it off and on in the Hops history of having been attempted, but probably never having been attempted as, as expansively as recently, and that is the idea of cross-program, cross-campus projects, of which the recent Class Divide project, which many of you know about and I'll return to, is a, um, is the, is a stellar example. So we are also, as you've heard, uh, the home to academic arts departments. The, the relationship with each of these departments is different, uh, partly because of geography, partly because of history. Um, theater, for instance, has two theaters in the building. Uh, we present a lot of what theater produces. Uh, studio art has, as you'll see, teaching spaces in the building. Much of those are going to move out, though, in, in the next phase that I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. Music you've heard about being downstairs um, and um, also having a separate uh, activity in digital musics in another building. Film and media studies actually not being physically in the building at all, but having a very activist relationship with um, our, uh, our own film program. Um, and like all of us, a lot of other things happen in the building that are not necessarily hop produced or hop sponsored, but that we need to help to make happen and we are highly motivated to make happen for a variety of reasons. The first three because they are so much a part of student life here, student creative life here. Um, and collaborations with non-arts departments as well, where, for instance, the classic example, as Kate knows, is the language department that wants to produce a language play in one of our theaters. That's an example of that. Increasingly, we're doing co-ventures with community groups. This is, to an extent, driven by pressure to create more revenue, um, but as well because we understand that there are other kinds of values out of that. 
Um, it's probably one of the most used spaces as a gathering place for the campus, having nothing to do necessarily with the arts, but having to do with gather gathering. For instance, the announcement of the new president happened here. For instance, the community gathered to hear the political debates here. Weddings and parties. We, do we all do have to do these or not? <laughs> so. Um, I, I, I must say that knowing a, a lot of uh, performing arts centers from across the country from my time on the other side of the table, it was incredible to me how, how intrinsically the Hopkins Center had managed to involve itself with students and the other way around. And we've recently been trying to do a better job of documenting this, both by doing surveys within our audiences as well as uh, two years ago, doing a very student-specific, what we call the cultural census of the campus. We got a very representational uh, cross-section of about a thousand undergraduate students replying to a lot of questions about what they think about us, what they would like us to be doing, that kind of thing. So and some, some of it was factual learning as well as, as this is. Uh, our, our workshops, though, on their own had kept track of student participation and an incredible percentage of students are in those workshops by the time they graduate. Uh, in that survey I was mentioning, uh, Despite all that we are worried about to do with students uh, and this generation, uh, they do see concerts and film. That is the gathering for concerts and film at the hop, is the way the, the uh, question was posed, as a vital activity. 10% uh, of Dartmouth students are actually in those ensembles that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we employ a lot of students, and that kind of gets us currency too. Um, and, uh, and finally, just going back to the visiting artist program, we have an incredible number of interactions with students through, uh, through residency activities that uh, take, take the artists, as, as almost all of us do, out of the building. And this is so not so much about our physical facility, but about uh, making them a part of the life of the rest of the campus. Here's a, another fast look at other kinds of ways of cutting the numbers. When we ask the question about uh, different kinds of ways that students uh, act, are involved in the hop, a huge percentage attend live per performance and film, a uh, very large percentage. Can everybody see the numbers? I mean, we're talking very close to 90% for the first thing, very close to 80% for see and present student works, uh, very close around 60% for learn or practice art, and a huge percentage also just about socializing in the hop. So, and then turning to the other side of the equation that all of us understand is a really, really important part of our picture, the community itself, the, the, the non-student community. Um, we, by doing some uh, 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 analysis of ticket sales as well as the local census uh, information, we, it does appear to us that we, are, we have roughly 30,000 annual individual non-student attendees which strikes me as an incredible penetration of the local market when you consider it's 90 to 100,000. If, if anybody in a city was getting that kind of penetration, imagine what the numbers would be. Uh, we, uh, we try to cover all levels of the community. Uh, a lot of the local leaders, the Chamber of uh, Commerce, uh, cite us as a crucial element of the community's vitality. We have an increasing number of alumni. Many of you are in cities and locations where your alumni are much bigger part because we're out in the wilderness, according to our motto. Mo, uh, motto. Um, um, mostly alumni go away after they uh, graduate, but increasingly we're seeing some come back as well and be a part of the audience or stay. Uh, faculty, also a significant percentage of audiences. Um, and, and because of that, uh, uh, we, we know from the Dean of the Faculty's Office that we are, we and the Hood Museum of Art and other important cultural elements of, of the campus are brought forward uh, in an important recruiting way as well. So just as a very over, oversimplified snapshot, this is what, you, what the audience turns out to be if you take all of this audience research we've been doing. That roughly a third of the audience in a given year and lately, that's around 80,000 uh, uh, individual uh, moments of attendance. Um, our students um, in the community, uh, the tenure uh, of people from one to 10 years is about a third, and then a, a somewhat larger percentage have been around a lot. And when you, when you dive into that larger percentage, you get a big loyalty factor. You get a big 
uh, response about we trust your programming, we will come to things you do even though we've never heard of them, that kind of uh, audience uh, loyalty. So taking all of that together, um, we would like to think that we begin from a foundation that's very healthy, okay? Um, now for a moment, uh, about uh, 50 years ago, this is almost exactly 50 years ago, uh, as uh, over a period of a couple of decades, Dartmouth has tried to figure out a way to start building a performing arts center. And finally, through the synergy of a very enterprising president and Nelson Rockefeller, who was a Dartmouth alum, who became uh, very much behind the whole project, he and his family, the family architect, was Wallace K. Harrison, as you may know, and he became our architect, um, decided to build this incredibly, I think, uh, risk-taking and expansive project on a campus that had never had anything close and in a community that had never had anything close. It was definitely a build it and they will come moment of extreme circumstances. And add to that that at this point, remember we're in the early 60s, none of the big, now we call them cultural temples in the country had been built yet. Dartmouth was at the beginning of that curve. None of the big uh, campus uh, multi-arts centers had been built yet. The earlier generation of them, of course, like Northrop, were there. But this whole uh, phase of building that started to happen in the 60s, Dartmouth was very much on the front end of. And so I say all of this because uh, it is part of the reason why we are turning our, our attention so much right now to the possibilities of building in the future because we do see the chance of in our 50th anniversary, which, which hits in two years, of seizing that kind of bravery in our history and saying we need to invent now or help the country invent the art center for this century, thus this symposium. So this is about a few weeks into the, uh, into the building's new existence. And what always amazes me about this picture is I imagine myself being one of the three people there turning around and seeing the 18th and 19th century, turning this way and seeing the 20th century. For the first time, Dartmouth having done that, both architecturally as well as this incredible commitment to the arts. And the world took notice. Um, <clears throat> the convening here was, um, was keynoted by the president of Lincoln Center, who actually remarked upon there being about 78 art centers starting to be under construction at that moment, uh, including his, uh, relatively speaking, we were being built at roughly the same time. And there was this great deal of attention to the mark that Dartmouth had decided to make about the arts being central to the liberal arts education. And I love that the, uh, that, that uh, we also had a misspelling in the times of that day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose if they saw me using this, I wouldn't even be able to have the copyright to show it, but uh, um, anyway. So a, a certain kind of impact right off the bat that was big. Um, and so as we begin to head towards the 50th anniversary, we, th we begin to think about ways to measure impact then over these 48 years that we've existed. I just sort of cherry picked a handful of, um, of alumni who've gone on to be graduates in the arts. Um, and I think mostly Dartmouth is invisible in this um, perspective in, for most people. The, you was kind of assume that Dartmouth is not that kind of a place. And when you consider that it's only 4,000 students, um, and at, at the time of its founding was less, f fewer students, um, it's an outsized, outsized alumni pool that have gone on to be successful, including, of course, uh, Palabalos, who is back for another visit uh, right now. The other kind of uh, leverage or impact that I'm increasingly interested in us uh, researching and understanding before we get to a 50th anniversary is the other kind of alumnus who isn't, doesn't become an artist, but somehow or another in their experience of the arts at the hop or, or elsewhere in their Dartmouth experience, they, be, they fall in love or maybe they build on a love that they already have. I know, for instance, that uh, uh, Bill Newcomb who was the chairman of the board of, uh, of uh, Dartmouth, 
uh, until recently, and who uh, was the founding general counsel of Microsoft, talks about, and his class is 64, so he's here right at the beginning, talks about the formative moment of taking his first drawing class in those studio spaces that you'll see uh, downstairs. And ev everybody here, and this is a scratching of the surface, the, the ones on the top being um, uh, recent or current uh, trustees, another couple uh, that I just added. If you took all of the 10 or so uh, overseers that we have at the top, each of them would have a similar uh, kind of uh, involvement to be able to quote. Um, in addition, over the years, of course, this, if we tried to do this list as it really is, uh, it would be immense and uh, impressive in ways beyond just the big names because Dartmouth over this time has commissioned 80 new works um, has had uh, all kinds of performing experiences beyond, um, beyond the ones that you see here, but it certainly paid attention to the big, to the big and distinguished uh, forces of our, of our time. And finally, another kind of impact that we are intent to be uh, uh, being much more careful about measuring and uh, getting beyond anecdotal, but for today, anecdotal. This was uh, at graduation a couple of uh, weeks ago, Don Glasgow, who heads the, uh, uh, the Barbary Coast Jazz Ensemble and is with us today, brought, me, brought this to my attention where, uh, of course, this student will remember for his whole life that kind of experience that he had in learning uh, and becoming better at jazz and has applications beyond just being able to play the saxophone. So um, what I want to do now is to shift to uh, talking a little bit about our vision for moving forward and then move to trying to see how that matches up with some of the ways that we've analyzed our uh, capital challenges. This is a recently drafted uh, vision statement wherein for the first time in uh, recent memory we've tried to wrestle with how do we think about the different audiences that we serve um, and I, I'm not going to try to take you through every single piece of this, but the, the, the one that I really want to draw attention to, because I think it drives a lot of the rest of it, and we've been hearing this word again and again and again today, is that uh, we increasingly see ourselves, partly because of what you've heard the faculty and the direction that they want to take things, and, and also the other examples that I'll show you as a laboratory, and as, as one that is not only about artistic experimentation and creative expression, as, as stated here, but also that uh, uh, has a lifelong, oops, didn't mean to do that quite that fast, uh, lifelong learning impacts that, uh, that are specific, that are distinctive to the way you learn through the arts. So I, I, I do have some pictures that uh, refer to things that faculty have already mentioned. Uh, Viscera, this incredible new pilot project that we have with uh, theater, computer science, and digital ha humanities in this most recent year. This is a student production, as you've heard. Those are some of the computer-generated images. This was a work exploring the, uh, a lot of the painful uh, um, uh, realities of, of war. And then uh, Michael's uh, Laptop Orchestra, which is a class, but which uh, um, uh, appeared at our uh, Arts Awards ceremony. And I, I, I mentioned this one to emphasize what Michael kind of mentioned in passing, that not only is it about exploring digital art making, but these are all students who have never been on a stage before. Uh, and so a lot of what we would like to think is happening in the building all the time is that kind of discovery of a new thing that you can do and that will be a thing that uh, you can take through the rest of your life. Um, another way that we think about this laboratory idea, um, aside from what goes on in these collaborations uh, that I just mentioned, is this idea of class divide and, and the creative campus, which we've, uh, as in MUPS, talked about a lot, where because we think that artists have a particularly uh, advantageous and in fact unique way of looking at the world and of addressing the, the pressing issues, social issues of the world, that by, by looking at those issues through their eyes, we can uh, engage and um, encourage a campus-wide and community-wide um, uh, conversation uh, and sometimes even um, formative outcomes uh, all because we've decided to make this place a laboratory of ideas 
and also have it be the kind of place where those ideas can play out in a lot of other places around, around the campus. This was the cover of the DVD that we put, put together. So you see all the elements here of immense community involvement and artists whose, oops, whose work we uh, supported over a period of three years, uh, is a work that's now touring, um, very close uh, integration of the artists uh, with uh, students and student situations, the great Peter Sellers among them with, our, with the Dartmouth Film Society. Uh, and then in the, um, in the visiting artists uh, program, uh, increasingly getting back, because when I mentioned 80 commissions before, um, it's been kind of uh, a, a wavy uh, kind of intensity over the years, where at the very beginning of the hop, a lot, a lot of commissioning, uh, as kind of a much slower period, and we are trying very much to ramp up as we head into the 50th anniversary to reclaim that as an important part of this being uh, a laboratory. This is actually uh, a uh, rehearsal shot from the piece we're seeing tomorrow night. This is the new piece. And Merce, whose new work, uh, Crossover, we brought to life, helped him bring to life uh, a couple of years ago. The other end, I might sort of of the dance spectrum. And then um, one of the most, I think, uh, interesting and sometimes provocative uh, collaborations we're doing with the theater department and have been, well, it's, this has been going on for like 17 or 18 years, but with Peter Hackett uh, coming on board about five years ago, um, the three-week residency of New York Theater Workshop here every summer not only has those artists able to develop to reading level, uh, stage reading level, six to eight uh, plays every year, but inculcates students into that process so that every week students who are taking a, a summer long course in uh, the making of new work for the theater are, are experiencing with professionals the process of developing that new work. Um, and in, then the Philip that we've sort of added in the last three years is even taking it further so that with, in this case, elevator repair service, we gave them a theater and a rehearsal space and students uh, for a period of three weeks, which had come at the, pretty close to the end of a maybe year and a half long uh, developmental process where they had been working on their latest project, Faulkner's uh, The Sound and the Fury. Um, Towards, uh, towards an end that then became part of the New York Theater Workshop season the next uh, spring, and also, in fact, took one of those students to become somebody who's now a regular member of their company. <laughs> kind of outcomes that you like. This was another New York Theater Workshop collaboration of the same sort, where three weeks, they're in residence, um, students inculcated uh, in, in every way in the process. And especially, this one actually went over two years where the first year was research, and then the second year, it being about Iraqi refugees, the second year was a much more uh, developed uh, uh, production. So um, that brings us then to the physical. And um, you might think that with all of that activity already going on, that, uh, well, why the hell do we need anything more, you know? <laughs> But the truth of the matter is, as you've heard from Peter and from Michael, and would hear from students if you talk to them, uh, who were in those uh, processes that I just described, you would certainly hear it from visiting artists who we talk with, where there are already limitations about their coming to be able to work with us because of not having enough space. That is, that is the reality. We have tested these ideas. We have been really happy with the outcomes of them, but we are already pushing the edges of availability of time and space to be able to deliver them in the way that um, uh, already shows to be so incredibly promising. So to bring you up to uh, speed very quickly with Dartmouth's overall capital planning picture as it applies to the arts, um, about 10 years ago, there was a master planning process, similar to some that you've heard uh, about today, where an arts district was defined and where, um, uh, where the Hood uh, Museum of Art uh, was actually originally envisioned to extend down this way. Uh, Brian Kennedy, who's the director of the Hood, um, 
has dreamed up some other ways for them to go now that this became uh, uh, the new visual arts center. And I'll, I'll give you another picture that gives you more a sense of the scale of it. I, I wanted to use this rendering which our planners gave me just so that you can get a sense for what that hole in the ground that you're all gonna see in a few minutes uh, <laughs> is supposed to eventually uh, uh, look like. Uh, so here's a, here's a, um, a picture though of, the, of what was then envisioned to be the arts district. Of course, as, as somebody said, it's the heating plant is surrounded by everything else. Um, uh, and what I'd like to do right now is just tell you a little bit about what that master plan advised should happen. And then um, uh, I'm not going to try to explain what's already in the building because you're going to see that very soon. But I'd, what I would like is for you to be seeing what's in the building through the lens of what was thought about 10 years ago and then the lens of what the latest thinking is. So um, the front of the building that looks out onto the green, that's this. Um, then in the middle of the building, Studio Art Studios, where because they will move to here, there's an incredible opportunity to address some of this need for rehearsal or laboratory space, however that gets defined. And two of the shreds are gonna be spending uh, their initial time there and thinking about them as both teaching and learning and places to create work. Um, in addition, uh, this was probably the biggest idea of that planning process. There's a parking lot, uh, oops, no, not there, uh, right here, wherein, uh, and that would be right on the other side of that facade, wherein uh, there's enough space to build two sizable presenting spaces, or I think increasingly what we think about them now as presenting spaces plus a lot of the other things we've been talking about today. And so that would be right here. Then uh, there was also, because when Spalding was built, as you might you can sort of tell that it didn't have a lobby. It was supposed to have a lobby in this space and would actually get a little bit more public space there. But the idea was to build out here as well so that there could become a whole new way of this plus this being a whole new entrance to this part of the arts district. And this as both public sort of audio, what we've been using the term audience engagement space, but also could be used as a, in a number of the other ways we've been talking about. Um, so that's, that was what was talked about uh, about 10 years ago um, with this uh, visual arts center being envisioned to be phase one. And in fact, that is what's about to happen. This, is, this was approved to be a part of the campaign that started at that point. The money, most of it, was raised for it. And so it is going to be built uh, and is prob uh, probably a very good piece of evidence of our new president and the current trustees' commitment to having the arts stay and grow healthier, uh, even at a time when a lot of budgets are being cut here. Um, so that was to be phase one. Our growth and the hoods growth was to be phase two, three, at the same time, kind of. So in, um, in re-examining all of this a, a couple of years ago and as part of a self-study, um, we, uh, we took um, an updated look at what we thought were the issues to do with the building. Um, and uh, they aren't exactly in priority order, but I, the first two or three are the ones that um, uh, definitely we keep returning to. Uh, the fact that it is about to be 50 years old, that it feels and looks like it, and that its technology resources are very limiting, as, as Michael mentioned, just one example of. Um, and, and this is probably, for me, the biggest driver, that, um, that because all of the, of the existence of all of those a cappella groups and other student activity, and because of this flowering of uh, laboratory and collaborative work, we have uh, increasingly unmet student usage demands that, uh, that we're just not fulfilling our mission and our vision by not doing. Uh, and when you look by genre uh, closely at this, uh, I think even theater, even my, uh, Peter in theater agrees that our, our most pressing needs are in the arena of music. It's about not having an in-between sized performing space. It's not having some of the other uh, dreamless things that Michael talked about. 
Um, rehearsal, though, for theater and dance, I list, and I'll get back to why that's even, may have more opportunities for having an impact. Um, you will also sense, I, ha I have a feeling, when you take your, uh, your uh, tours that there are definite navigational issues and definite, definite issues to do with public spaces. Uh, there are also accessibility issues. There's also, you're going to feel this one too, um, because only the theaters are air conditioned. Uh, and uh, and you, I think you saw during lunch <laughs> the inadequacy of our backstages, at least in this, in this hall. Uh, imagine that this hall was serving 100 singers in an 80-person orchestra and that had that backstage about five weeks ago. And that's not an infrequent occurrence. Uh, we also would love for our ceramics uh, uh, workshop to be up here rather than across the river, which is where it is right now. So looking at flipping the uh, way of looking at this the, and considering the opportunities, some of them near term, you're going to see Alumni Hall in a bit. And uh, we already have fairly modestly priced um, uh, ideas for turning it much more conducively into a performing arts space that could also be serve a number of these laboratory needs that we've talked about. So use existing space is definitely a mantra we're beginning with. Uh, certainly we see one of the opportunities, this moment where people and departments are working together in ways that they haven't, at least not in a lot of people's memories. And finally, getting back to this idea of uh, rehearsal space for theater and dance, um, one, of the, uh, one of the rhythms of the building is that for the Moore Theater, it's, you'll, you're not going to be able to see it today because Palabolus is in residence, but it, uh, in a 10-week term, uh, our presenting program gets access to the first two weeks, and then for the rest of the term, the theater department uh, needs to use that space for producing its so-called main stage production because there is no rehearsal space anywhere in the building or nearby that comes close to being as big as the Moore Stages Theater. <laughs> and so a significant performing asset on the college is tied up probably for at least four weeks a term that it probably shouldn't be. And Peter has, and I have talked about this even pedagogically. Students should not have this experience of developing a piece of theater for eight weeks in, a th in the theater space. It's just, it's just crazy. But it's what we have. So, so there is one really good reason to have a big rehearsal space that could function to serve some of these laboratory needs as well. Um, so we're at the beginning of revisiting planning um, and thinking about how, what are the optimal uh, planning steps for moving forward, talking with uh, Linda Snyder, who's here, uh, who's VP for um, facilities and capital planning, as well as Carol and Kate and our colleagues in all these departments. So really today's symposium is the start of having best practice of trying to learn from uh, the field, from artists, from students, from teachers, uh, what we uh, optimally could or should be doing. Uh, I think one of the other verities of the process going forward, because we've been able to see this uh, incredibly encouraging interaction and collaborative, of a collaborative sort on projects of an artistic sort, it should also carry over into the actual physical planning process itself. So ideally, we will, in the next year or two, develop a new master plan for the Arts District. And ideally, in the strategic planning that begins in the fall, that Arts District becomes a strategic priority as Dartmouth moves forward to its, as it will always do, its next campaign. <laughs> uh, so uh, very quickly, uh, for the, on the renovation part, reconfigure Alumni Hall, reanimate existing public spaces, uh, repurpose those vacated spaces I mentioned for uh, lab space, uh, emphasize interdisciplinary opportunities, and on the expansion side, it's all about, it's, it's very similar to what Mike said, where we really want to have spaces where work can be developed, but that it also provides opportunity to show it uh, and to have the world see it. Uh, new public spaces, and I left the most mundane to last, but uh, in fact, we're open to and would like to relocate our office so, offices, so we're in the midst of all this, and there are some very productive uses that uh, the Hood Museum has in mind for them if we can figure out a way to do that. So um, I just wanted to end by uh, revisiting the sort of 50-year 50 50 year ago thing of um, they built it, 
uh, and they came. I think really we're at a moment right now where the risks are not really that big, as big as that. Because I think what we've seen in the decade or so from the strategic planning, pro the, the master planning process of 10 years ago, what we've seen is such a growth in demand that in fact where we are today is build it and there's 10 years of unmet demand that's ready to fill it. <laughs> and by the way, we think there are audiences that are going to be there for it too because pretty much all of those lab projects that I mentioned played, if they had an, if they had an audience moment, to full houses. So, thank you. <laughs>